The dialogue. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bhutani, for coming in today. And hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our seventh series of the Tech for Good discussion and broadcast uh, around how technology is playing an important role during the COVID times and the post lockdown and the post COVID scenario. What does the economic situation look like? And what are the key policies uh, which the uh, industry and the tech sector is facing? So, to talk today about a few of those, and especially on taxation, I have a very special guest with me, Mr. Mukesh Bhutani, who is not only an Indian renowned tax expert, but a global leader on tax policy and tax issues. And we are very grateful to you, sir, for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm doing well, uh, cousin. Uh, good morning to you. Morning, and thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bhutani, for coming in and uh, doing this. Uh, I guess you are in your office or you are at home. Yes, this is my residence chamber uh, and uh, I'm making full use of it in uh, these days. Not that I don't make use of it on the weekends uh, when briefings occur, but uh, this has been, uh, uh, I would say, a saving grace uh, in these times. The first one week was difficult, but thereafter, I think I've got so used to it. Uh, I must say that I'm fully equipped. Great, great. I think the work from home culture has really got on with lawyers and consultants as much as with other organizations. So thank you so much. Mr. Well, the, only, the only aspect is that we miss the courts and tax matters do not fall in the priority of urgent hearings of any of the courts. That's great. But that's one thing I don't miss because I started, uh, of course, I'm a law graduate. I started my career as a lawyer, but I quickly left the profession, I realized litigation wasn't my cup of tea. But uh, thank you so much for coming in today, Mr. Botani. So today I want to sort of talk about tax uh, issues which you know the industry is facing and especially around equalization levy that has been imposed on e-commerce operations and advertising businesses, which was introduced by the government after the budget was announced in the Finance Act, which is of course 2% uh, of the equalization levy. I would like to start, Mr. Bhutani, with respect to the equalization levy itself and how does it differ the 2020 version with the other 16 equalization levy which was imposed by the government? Well, the equalization levy law is uh, not new. Uh, it was first uh, legislated in 2016. India was amongst the first countries to uh, introduce that kind of a levy. Uh, it is not income tax, neither is it in the nature of a VAT levy. But it has been introduced as what is called as an interim measure uh, to be able to tax certain forms of transactions, which ordinarily under the uh, traditional rules of taxation will not be taxed. It was introduced in 2016 as a very simple levy. The levy was on the uh, person who was availing of the advertising services. So if there is a resident Indian that is availing of the uh, advertising services, digital advertising services, I mean, from a foreign service provider, then there was an equalization levy, which is what we call it as a B2B specified transactions, advertising being a specified transaction. Uh, there were no changes between 2016 and 2020, insofar as this law is concerned. In 2020, the levy was expanded. Now, how was the levy expanded. The levy was expanded in two, three forms. Number one, the incidence of, of equalization levy was not just on the person who's availing the services, but on the person who's providing the services, which is a non-resident service provider, which means that it included goods, it included services, it included intermediaries and facilitators that were providing the goods and services. And then there is a residuary fourth category. So the application is very broad now. It's moved from B to B to B to C and the incidence has moved from the service recipient to the service provider. Mr. Bhutani, do you think it's fair to say that this is now the introduction of something called a digital services tax uh, that the government is sort of looking to impose going forward? Well, the concept of uh, digital tax, Google tax, uh, as internationally it is known, uh, it, is a big concept. I think the uh, multilateral institutions such as the OECD do understand what this tax is and the philosophy is no different than what I explained the philosophy of equalization levy. Basically to, to tax certain transactions which cannot be taxed under the traditional rules. Uh, so yes, if you're referring to digital tax from that perspective, you're correct. 
Uh, however, uh, the levy, incidence of levy, and the pace of levy will differ from country to country simply because tax is a right. sovereign subject, and and countries take a decision what should be the base and what should be the basis. So, if you compare India's equalization levy from the so-called generic definition of digital tax, then of course it is much more wider in terms right. of application. For example, it just does the services which is what is covered internationally, it covers goods as well. Certain countries cover only the e-commerce service provider. Here, mm. even the intermediaries are covered. So if you look at the, the fundamentals of the law, and if you read the law as we lawyers do, then it is very right. wide in terms of its application. And if, if that's the case, Mr. Bhutani, if it's so broad in terms of the implementation and application, do you think there will be implementation challenges going forward? And how will the government enforce this? I've always wondered uh, with respect to that. So undoubtedly, uh, Kazim, the law is uh, right now, as it in the stated form, uh, is not sufficient to be implemented. There are many definitional aspects of the law which are unclear. Uh, there are certain definitions like, say, for example, what is a consideration? Is it a gross consideration? Is it a net consideration? How it will apply? So many, many aspects of the law are unclear. I think that the law now in terms of its implementation just doesn't require the relevant forms and how does one comply with it, but it also requires several aspects in the law to be clarified which is what the Department of Revenue is referring to as a Q&A that they want to issue. And without the Q&A, which is what right. we as a subordinate legislation, the law is just not in a shape and form to be implemented. I also want to understand the, the way it was implemented because it wasn't part of the earlier budget, the budget which came. And then it, it finds itself in the Act. And there was no clarification issued. Uh, this is very similar to RBI's data localization policy or especially uh, when it came out the April 2018 order, you know, the FAQ was released the next year. Now, what message are we sending to the industry uh, with respect to inconsistent approaches, especially during a time when we are probably facing the greatest economic crisis of our generation? So to your question, Kazim, cuts two ways. Uh, let's try and look at it from a government perspective. As you correctly pointed out, the final passage of the law which was by way of a amendment that was moved was when the country was already in lockdown. As you will recall, the parliamentary process uh, was rushed into on the 2nd and the 3rd of April to be able to make sure that all the bills go through the passage and mm -hmm. finance bill of 2020 was a very important bill because without that bill, the government can't incur expenditure and equalization levy or the amendments to the equalization levy were an integral part of that bill as well. So, uh, at that point in time, in a lockdown situation, the lawmakers could have visualized the situation that if there is any sector that's likely to do well, it is going to be uh, the e-commerce sector. And hence, let's try and levy this tax because the tax collections from other primary sectors of the economy are going to show a slowdown. So that's the government perspective. But from a taxpayer perspective or from the point of view of other stakeholders, the law is not just very widely worded. It's vague in many aspects. Mm. It lacks clarity. It is not in a shape to be implemented. Mm. Leaving on the challenges that are there, if any of the taxpayers decided to pursue a route of challenging the constitutional validity of the law, the law as it stands today is just not in a shape to be implemented. And to make the law now applicable from April 1 uh, is, in my view, an extremely unfair proposition. Right. Uh, Mr. Bhutani, I also want to move, move ahead with respect to certain taxation issues. Uh, now, it appears that this is on gross consideration. Now, if, if such tax commensurate to the fact that heavy investment is needed to sort of dive the online digital businesses, so if you're looking at gross consideration, do you think that is the right approach to, to go about it? Well, Kazim, your question has two connotations to it. One is the quantum of investment and taking into consideration the quantum of investment, the threshold. The second aspect is the clarity. What does the consideration actually mean? Is it gross or is it net? Let's try to take it, both the questions separately. The threshold for the law is two crores of rupees, 20 million. Uh, well, if you recognize the fact that a e-commerce service provider 
is now subjected to say uh, complying with india's equalization law on a threshold of 20 million rupees then clearly from an investment point of view it is not justified now when you talk about investment it could be two kinds of investments investments that are made in india and investments that are not made at all so there are several thousands and if not millions of uh, websites right. you, you know so called now they fall in the broader definition of an e-commerce service provider or a platform creator whichever term you want to use because all of these terms have been used in the law now all of these are finding themselves subjected to the legislation <laughs> levy some of them have, may have operations in india may have back end facilities in india may have created logistics in india yes from their point of view it is not at all justified from the point of view people who not made the investments it is not justified even from their point of view let's say for instance there is an online database services company that provides certain services uh, to indian customers it's a small unknown company and let's assume that the revenue is a million dollars now for a million dollars revenue into india they will also have to comply with the equalization levy so that is where the disproportionality the law comes in you have someone who made an investment it is certainly not justified given the fact that the threshold is 20 million rupees and there is someone who's not made the investment but the revenues are minuscule and hence uh, it has uh, you know that's the disproportionality argument that comes in mm. the second question that you raised was on the term consideration yes absolutely valid should it be on gross should it be on net now it's extremely unfair that you levy equalization levy on the gross particularly if it's on sale of products because the e-commerce platform service provider is merely a facilitator he's not taking right. delivery of the goods and he's selling is he's making commission so justice and fairness uh, guides us to say that the levy base should be on the commission that the e-commerce service provider earns and not on the gross consideration there are many other aspects let's take a case of a travel portal what happens right. if a travel portal sells the ticket but also the ticket is cancelled and there is a refund should the levy be on the net value of the commission that he has earned or should it be on the gross value of the ticket that he has sold in the first instance and if that be the case what happens to the amount that is going to be refunded because there is no mechanism under the law to claim a refund of the equalization levy so this is where the arbitrariness and the unfairness part of the law comes in after listening to you mr gutani it appears to me that there are really like multiple layers of detailing with respect to not just the definition the operation part but the implementation part of the law and uh, i it appears that they haven't thought through uh, am i right to assume that no i don't think that, uh, that they have thought through this uh, levy uh in, in in you know if i look at the manner in which uh, the law has been drafted to me it seems that uh these forms of uh, drafting of the law uh, are very common uh, when you levy any form of tax on transactions which is the indirect tax levy you know it uh, goods services goods and services or a combination of 1 2 3 you know these mm. these are typical forms of transaction taxes right now when you try and import that kind of a language into a direct tax levy it becomes arbitrary because at the end of the day a direct tax levy is tax on income income would mean tax on profits tax on mm. net income but these are transaction taxes because the base of tax is consideration so you are now trying to have a direct tax levy not by way of income tax strictly speaking but by way of transaction taxes and hence you are borrowing the concepts of transaction taxes and importing into this new law does it also amount to double taxation in some cases would it would it lead to over taxation for the same transaction well when you use the term double taxation uh, you know you have to give a context to it uh, right the face of it yes if you look at it from a consumer point of view it is a case of double taxation but if you look at it from a legal perspective then the answer will differ first of all let's try and look at you know does does our constitution permit to levy tax uh, twice on a particular transaction so there is no 
prohibition in the in the constitution for levying of double taxation and there are situations in which there are overlap so there are many forms of transaction where uh, there is an overlap of tax a classic example is uh, when we had the in the pre gst era uh, if you availed of certain uh, hotel services let's assume that you are availing of the room services then the state governments levied what they call it as a luxury tax and the federal government levied what they call it as a service tax it was the same transaction which was liable to tax twice however there is a difference between that form of dual levy and the dual levy that we are experiencing in the context of equalization levy law and this th this is what takes us to what we call it as the aspect theory in the example that i gave you for the hotel industry on levy of dual tax on the hotel there is a particular aspect there is an aspect of luxury in so far as the state government is concerned and there is an aspect of service in so far as the usage is concerned and other and 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 so there are aspects to both of this however the aspect theory seems to be missing in the context of equalization levy because it is a same transaction on which you may land up levying gst and the same transaction you may land up levying a equalization levy so under the gst law there is a levy uh, which is uh, on the online information uh, and database retrieval services now this particular class of services will not just suffer, suffer a gst but it will also suffer right. equalization levy so and and the aspect is missing unlike in the context of a hotel industry so 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 uh, to summarize yes this is a classic case of dual uh, levy of tax